So anyway, Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 5 this morning. Um, but before we start on our study, why don't we uh, go to God in the Lord's Prayer. Holy and divine, ever to be adored, Heavenly Father. We come before you this morning so grateful for the opportunity to gather so grateful for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. Father, we recognize these as being tremendous blessings. And we are grateful for every blessing that you have poured into our lives. And, and Father, the list of that of those blessings just is far more than any one of us can number. Father, we are thankful to you for all these all these spiritual blessings, as well as all the physical blessings you've given to us. We pray you be with us this morning as we study your word, and help us to understand the things that we read here. <clears throat> Father, we pray that you would uh, help us to have insights, uh, help us to, to know uh, what it is that we're seeing, and help us, Father, to be able to make application in, in ways that would really benefit us and Show your glory to those around us. Our Father, we pray that you please look down upon us in your mercy and forgive us of our sins. Help us and correct us when we need correcting and encourage us in those areas that we need encouraging. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Well, last time in verses 1 through 4, we were just taking a look very quickly at the uh, story of the widow's mites. Here, there was a Jesus was watching people put in uh, sums of money into the temple treasury, and in doing so, here comes a widow, and she has only a couple of small coins uh, that were worth, well, pretty much virtually nothing. Um, but it's all she had to live on, Jesus said. But she ends up throwing those in, and and despite the bags of money possibly that other richer folks might have thrown in there, Jesus makes mention of hers as being something that, her gift as being something that was greater than all of their gifts because they were giving out of abundance while she was giving all she had. Uh, and one of the things that teaches us, of course, is that generosity is greatly appreciated and noticed by God. Uh, it's not a matter of how much we give, it's a matter of um, generosity. Uh, and for some people, a little bit is quite generous. For other people, a great deal is not as generous as it could be. Anyway. Leading on then, however, to verse 5, what we're ending up finding is a, uh, a lot of teaching that uh, has been, I don't know, I guess the source of a great deal of uh, controversy, a great deal of uh, false teaching, uh, and a whole lot of head scratching, <laughs> I guess you could say. Uh, because this sort of a difficult passage, though I'm going to make the attempt to try to make it a little bit easier, uh, but uh, why don't we read, starting in verse 5, and it's actually a fairly lengthy reading, but, uh, but stick with me because it is, it is useful to know all of it in context. Starting in verse 5. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you're looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They question him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you're not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. 
Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, plagues and famines. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you'll be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and recognize that her desolation is near, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. Because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations, perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard, so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you will have strength, that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place, and to stand before the Son of Man. Now the day now during the day he was teaching in the temple, but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple listen to. So, what were people talking about uh, that caused Jesus to begin talking about the destruction of the temple? Because that's what he's talking about. They here. were impressed with the beauty of the temple and how the stones fit upon one another and so forth. And yeah. I think you've mentioned it before, but these stones weighed several thousand pounds, and yet there wasn't a hammer in use at the temple site. Yeah. They fitted them so precisely and carted them several hundred miles, and, yeah. and they fit together as if they were made. And I guess they were. <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's not even any mortar. They're just what is referred to sometimes as dry stacked. Uh, but they just fit together so so perfectly. But it was a, it was a beautiful temple. Uh, we're not talking now at this particular point about Solomon's temple. That was apparently super grand. But, the, uh, but even the temple that Herod had built was... Apparently, really quite beautiful indeed. Um, and not only had Herod decorated it well, a good architect, but he had all that. But there's also it, it notes there uh, even uh, the beautiful stones and votive gifts. What's a votive gift? 
those were gifts that were given to God and they were apparently on display and the more impressive ones were on display at the temple yeah yeah um, don't know whether you've passed by uh, the Hindu temple that's down over here at uh, Independence uh, and so forth um, but uh, that went up kind of plain but over the years I've been here I've noticed it's gotten decorated more and the decorations basically are votive offerings from the Hindus that are there to whatever god that's a temple to maybe it's several gods for all I know um, but but it's, it's kind of like I'm going to pay X amount of dollars in order to put jewels on things or maybe a gold leaf on something or whatever it might be. The point at least is, is that apparently Herod's temple was really quite beautiful and as they were leaving the temple there were people that were somewhat, I don't know, misunderstood I think a lot of times and certainly has been the source of I think some false teaching them from time to time. But one of the key issues uh, in understanding this passage is understanding the idea of what a double prophecy is. Um, I may read what I wrote here. Uh, That'll end up probably taking less time than if I just kind of uh, wing it. Uh, One of the more misunderstood portions of the gospel is this prophecy from Jesus found here in Luke and also in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. The conclusion is centered around whether it's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 AD, approximately 40 years later, or about the end of time. Clearly, Jesus is talking about them both. But how can you discern whether he's talking about one or the other? The threads of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple seem to be intertwined with the threads of prophecy about the end of time in a way that makes it difficult to know what prediction applies to which event. While there are clearly some mysteries, which are prophecies that are given only in vague, veiled forms in this prophecy, the secret to untangling things here is a prophetic style or device called a double prophecy, which can be found in many of Old Testament prophets. Essentially, it is one prophecy with one or more fulfillments. Some of the elements of the prophecy are true of both, but some of the elements apply to only one. And here's just a few examples of some of that. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, uh, finds the prophet Nathan giving David the promise of a son, referring to Solomon, uh, who would continue David's kingdom and build a house for the Lord, the Jerusalem temple, instead of David. In another sense, the prophecy also referred to the Messiah, Jesus, who would both sit on David's throne and build God's house, the church. One prophecy, two fulfillments. A double prophecy. Isaiah is full of a lot of these kind of prophecies, too. Uh, And I give a list of examples there. Uh, And most of these, by the way, are what are known as remnant prophecies. Um that are speaking of the return of the nation of Israel from captivity, but also referring to the church, that the Gentiles stream from the nation's design. Uh, In these prophecies I've listed there in in Isaiah, you end up finding these uh, these remnant prophecies. Uh, The remnant prophecies uh, are about, initially, about Israel returning out of exile back to Palestine, their homeland. Uh, But they also end up making reference as well to the church. Uh, When you're reading through, it it becomes pretty clear that that it's talking about both. Again, one prophecy, two fulfillments. Uh, Same thing in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah's double prophecies too. Uh, And Daniel's prophecies, Uh, especially as it refers to the abomination of desolation, uh, is referencing uh, not only the destruction of the temple, uh, but perhaps even the end time. Um, it's another double prophecy. There is lots of others I, you know, I could be citing, but hopefully these examples uh, suffice to illustrate how one, a double prophecy works, and two, 
that it's a relatively common means of revealing God's plan for the future while concealing some things that God wants to keep as mysteries. In many ways, it is similar to type and antitype sort of stuff, uh, also seen in Scripture. For example, Melchizedek, uh, the Melchizedek Jesus connection, the Israel church connection, the Babylon Rome connection. Um, so uh, it kind of follows in that same sort of a, a pattern type, antitype, double prophecy, they're all kind of sort of the same uh, ilk, I guess you could say. So, what exactly were Jesus' prophecies about the destruction of the temple and the end? Um, turning over to the part that's oriented differently, uh, and taking a look at uh, the passage Luke 21 as well as the parallel passages that we can find in Matthew and Mark um, where did Jesus make the comment about not one stone being left on another yeah when they put the stones together the, the mortar holding them together had gold dust in it so literally, they were they were harvesting the gold in the mortar when they took the stones apart. In some cases, that's true. Uh, Jesus, whenever he starts this prophecy, is talking is is right around the temple. They're apparently like leaving the temple. Uh, the uh, just so you kind of have something of an orientation, uh, the temple was on the eastern side of Jerusalem uh, and it faced toward the east. Uh, toward the east of Jerusalem there is a valley, the Kidron Valley, K-I-D-R-O-N. Uh, and on the other side is the, what we call the Mount of Olives or all of that. Um, and so Jesus is leaving the temple area and he's apparently going down into the valley, the Kidron Valley. Uh, the reason is because apparently he was spending the night uh, on the Mount of Olives every evening. Uh, and so they're walking in that direction. As they're walking in that direction, that's when people are, you know, you know how people kind of, you know, they'll be walking along and they'll be kind of looking over their shoulder and maybe kind of turn around and, man, that's a beautiful building sort of thing. Uh, and that's when Jesus ends up making that, these remarks about not one stone being left on another. Well, apparently, uh, that might have been a little bit confusing, I suppose, or shocking or whatever, uh, to the apostles and perhaps some other disciples that were following him. Uh, but it really isn't until a little bit later that uh, the apostles ask him uh, for deeper comment on this. Uh, where were the apostles when they started asking him more about this? They were assuming this was the end of time. They were assuming it was the end of time. And they began asking him these questions uh, while they were sitting on the Mount of Olives. Uh, probably because, once again, if you're sitting on the Mount of Olives uh, and facing toward the valley... What are you seeing? The temple. You're taking a look at it, which probably reminded them of this, of this remark that Jesus had made about not one stone being left on another. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> I can imagine. Can you imagine how the conversation might have gone? You know, Jesus, a little while ago, you said that not stone, not one stone was going to be left on another. What were you talking about? Were you talking about the end of the world? What's going on here? Could you explain this more to us? What's what's really happening here? Um, and as you were saying, Jim, the presumption uh, about the temple being destroyed was that surely that would be the end of the world. Uh, that that was just so uh, beyond the pale, beyond their imagination. That's what they were assuming probably was going to happen. Um, now, Jesus could have told them plainly, right? Here's what's going to happen. Another 30, 40 years down the road, 
the Romans are going to come in, they're going to surround the place, they're going to destroy the city, they're going to burn the temple, it's all going to be destroyed, they're going to rip everything down because the people that were that were rebelling against Rome were just so obstinate and so rebellious that they decided they were going to teach Jerusalem a lesson and just raise it to the ground. That's what they're going to do. Uh, he could have said that, but he didn't. What does he say instead? <laughs> he speaks in what is sometimes referred to as a mystery, right? That's what he ends up doing. And we've talked about mysteries before. What is a mystery? Something that no, no one knows the answer to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a murder mystery, right? You know, who done it? Uh, well, this is sort of along the same line. Uh, but uh, a mystery in Scripture basically boils down to a, a veiled prophecy. Uh, a prophecy that is just vague enough that it gives you the broad outlines of what's going on without giving you the details of how it's going to happen. Uh, the way that I've illustrated it sometimes in the past is imagine uh, that, that someone drops uh, a white sheet down here in front and, uh, and someone perhaps also has a light back here and, uh, and suddenly you see a, a shadow on the, uh, the sheet. Right? Um, you can see the form. Maybe from the form you might be able to tell is the man or a woman, are they tall, are they short, are they fat, are they thin? You know what, you can tell that sort of stuff. But still, you might not be able to tell exactly who it is. Um, and that's sort of the idea behind mysteries. It's giving you a, a vague idea of what's going to happen without giving you details. Um, do we have mysteries in the New Testament? Well, this is one of them. We're reading one right now. But also just about everything in Revelation, right? Uh, we see a whole lot of vague ideas about what's going to happen. Uh, and we know in the end who wins. God wins, and those that are with him win. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, details, oh, people have been looking for the details in Revelation since probably since the day it was written. Okay, they've been looking for the details because, as the advertisement used to go, inquiring minds want to know, right? We want to know these things. But the prophecies are simply uh, veiled. And so we don't have all the details there. Um, but often they know all the details, and they know how to uh, arrive at the point where they can, you know, be resolved, you know, because they know what's going to transpire. Yeah. It's just like that's why it's in the suspense, you know, it lets you know to stay on your P's and Q's because <laughs> it's going to be a reckoning somewhere. Yeah. And you don't know the time or the hour. Mm -hmm. so, that's pretty much what's happening. Yeah. So it's telling you to be ready. Be ready, exactly. Um, why why does God sometimes speak in mysteries? Now you just listed one of those reasons why. God God probably wants to help you know, help us keep on our toes, as it were. Uh, what if God had said, as some people have have predicted, that I am coming back, uh Let's make it 15 years in our future or something, okay? I'm coming back in 2040, and it's going to be on January the 3rd, okay? Now, if people really believe that, what is likely to happen in the world around us? Yes, sir? I want to have some party until then. It'll, it'll, it'll be party time until January 1, right? <laughs> And then I'll straighten my life out, and and we'll we'll be good to go. Um, so so that that's part of the reason why. Um, sometimes it also has sometimes the details have a great deal to do with men's decisions, and so maybe God doesn't know the the, the specifics; He just knows it's going to happen because He's going to allow it to happen. Uh, but for example. 
did Judas have a choice in what he did? He sure he did. He sure he did. Um, but what if Judas had chosen not to do what he did? God would have found someone else who would be willing to do that, willing to betray his Lord. Um, because when you take a look at, at how God ends up working, remember, I, I always like to go back to the story of uh, uh, Esther, where uh, Esther's having this conversation with, with her uncle Mordecai, uh, and and she's saying, you know, Mordecai's saying, you know, you've got to go to the king, you've got to help rescue all of your, your fellow Jews. And she's saying, oh, I don't know if I can do that. You know, this, this is just a job for me. Uh, if I go into the king's presence without being invited, why, he could kill me. Blah, 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 offering these excuses. And what does Mordecai say to her? If you don't do it, God will find somebody else. If you don't do it, God will find somebody else. But who knows? All of this may have taken place so you can do it. Yeah, all these, things, all these, these stars have aligned, you know, it's so... You seem to be one, the one chosen by God because you're in the best position to do that. But I think one of the things that this ends up teaching is that God doesn't have just an A plan. He has a B plan and a C plan and a triple Z plan. It's going to happen one way or the other. Uh, and my point very simply is, is that perhaps in some cases the reason, that, again, for mysteries may be because of men's choices. God doesn't force anyone to make a choice. And if someone chooses to do right instead of wrong, or wrong instead of right, it's going to change the equation somewhat, but God is nevertheless going to make sure that whatever he has prophesied is in fact going to happen in the story. Yes, sir. I, I was going to say, it seems very specific, though, from the standpoint that Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, know that the desolation is near. That's a pretty specific message that I think from a prophecy standpoint to me it implies he's letting them know in a sense this is going to happen without all the particulars of what's going to go down. Well I think you're right uh, that is that is pretty specific how could he have made it more specific? Well, well he could have said this is not the end of the world well, this is just going to be the destruction of the Jewish because they, they have surrounded the city, then they left for whatever reason, and that was the time they got out of the city. Right. I think the Christians knew, like, hey, we need to go. But but where, where I was going with the question was, Jesus could have been more specific and said, when the Romans oh, yeah. come and surround your city, then you can know. But instead he just says, when armies surround. Uh, I think he's being a little bit vague in part because of this double prophecy idea. Because you see, this also ends up applying likewise to what the scripture tells us is going to be happening toward the end of time, right? When, well, keep your finger, of course, where you are, but turn over to Revelation chapter 20. This is that famous section where Satan is being bound, but also, look down to verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, and they come up on the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints. Then the beloved city, what would be the beloved city? Jerusalem, but he's not talking about a literal Jerusalem here. He's just talking about the spiritual Jerusalem. All right, they're coming to surround all that stuff, uh, and, and fire comes down from heaven and devours them. Okay, so all that said, I think part of the reason that Jesus is being vague is because this is in fact a double prophecy. He's talking not only about the destruction of Jerusalem that was going to happen in 70 A.D., but he was also going to talking about persecution and near destruction if not complete destruction of the church before the end of time is kind of what he's talking about here and so he's being vague for that reason as well um, so that's why Jesus isn't speaking quite so plainly because 
he's talking in double prophecy and he wants what he's saying to have application not only to the near term fulfillment but also to the long term fulfillment as well that's why he's being not quite as plain as we'd like I have a follow up question so he talks to them about you're going to hear many come in my name before these things happen do we have a record of people actually claiming to be Jesus prior to the destruction of Jerusalem not necessarily being Jesus but Messiah the Messiah okay uh, and and who knows, but maybe toward, you know, one of the things that's, that's said, and again, this is mystery time, okay? But in Second Thessalonians, when the Apostle Paul is talking about the, the man of sin and so forth, one of the things that is said about the man of sin is that he is going to claim to be God. He's going to try to sit on the throne of God. Is that what he's talking about? Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe there might be others who may, may claim to be the Messiah. Uh, interestingly enough, oh, what was the guy's name? It's like right on the tip of my tongue. It was a rabbi who started with an S-C-H-L, like Schlinkman or something like that. Anyway, this was back in the 90s. Uh, and among the Jews, Rabbi, and I don't remember his name again, I'm going to call him Schlenkman, but that's probably not it. But it was, it was something like that. Um, some were saying that he was the Messiah. And he wasn't denying it. And so when he died, there were some that were actually looking for his resurrection. But of course he wasn't. Um, all that said, there are and have been from time to time people who do claim to be Messiah, uh, the rescuer, uh, the savior of Israel. Um, and Jesus is, is saying that stuff is going to happen. People are going to come in my name. Maybe not necessarily Jesus, but in Messiah's name. Uh, that's who I am. I'm the savior of Israel. But he says... Don't uh, don't believe him. Um, many will come in his name, claiming to be Messiah. Wars and rumors of wars, and I'm kind of getting behind on my thing here. Um, wars and rumors of wars were, in fact, going to occur. Uh, earthquakes and famine was going to occur. Uh, many, the Scripture says, will be misled. Uh, and once again, this kind of fits especially good when it comes to uh, the second Thessalonian passage where he's talking about the man of sin it's talking about how an awful lot of people will be uh, deceiving and being deceived all at the same time uh, so there will be signs and wonders uh, what might that make reference to when he talks about earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars yeah a lot of people take these sorts of things as being yeah, signs that the end is coming. Floods, earthquakes. Um, what makes these different from genuine signs from God? These are more natural. Yeah, a lot of these are more natural disasters and that kind of stuff. We just not to say that God's not behind. You know, God could be behind natural disasters. Clearly. But uh, you know, these aren't necessarily the kinds of signs that, that Jesus is referring to just before the end. Uh, but in any case, I, I, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of worthwhile to wonder some of these things. Jesus usually ends up giving uh, a bit more, well, he does give something of a specification, doesn't he? What's going to happen just before the end, just before the destruction? Armies surround Jerusalem. Uh, but wars and rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes, all that stuff, the world is littered, literally littered with all these events. 
Uh, and every time some big event like this happens, everyone's always saying, oh, is, is, is this the end of the world? Well, people have been saying that for centuries now. But before all that happens, did you notice that uh, <coughs> men will persecute disciples? Um, he says, uh, where was I? I'm in Revelation, no wonder I can't see it. Um, verse 12, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony um, once again is this something that happened before AD 70 yes. lots yeah exactly uh, pretty much the whole history of the apostle Paul in the book of Acts <laughs> was him being, being I mean Paul when he was Saul was arresting Christians and bringing them to, out of the synagogues to Jerusalem uh, to stand before the Sanhedrin to either get uh, a prison sentence or perhaps even put to death over what they were doing. Uh, and the Apostle Paul, once he became a Christian, found himself also under persecution. And all these things happened. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul was put to death before 70 A.D. occurred. So uh, all these things turned out to be Right on. Well, you almost saw immediately after his ascension, Peter and were drugged before the Sanhedrin, and eventually here kills James with the sword. I mean, there were a lot of events that were short period after he left. Definitely. Definitely. And, go ahead. I know how the temple was destroyed. Uh huh. In the movie Driving Miss Daisy, Miss Daisy was a Jew and she was strong in her faith and she was being driven to the temple one day to worship and the man told her, you can't go to the temple today, they're going to bomb the temple. But ah, okay. It, it was bombed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it is worthwhile noting that... Uh, Synagogues are sometimes referred to as temples. Uh, so uh, the Jews themselves will refer to that. And part of the reason is because they have had to, they've had to reinterpret the law of Moses because synagogue worship now has become a replacement for sacrifice. Why can't they make animal sacrifices anymore? There's no temple. So they've had to re, rework their theology so that uh, their synagogues and the reading of the Torah and the worship of God, that has now become the sacrifice uh, that is supposed to be offered on the altars, the animal sacrifices. But you're right. But now, speaking again of this, the, this double prophecy idea, uh, is it is it possible, probable, or predicted that there will be persecution before before the real <coughs> end of ends comes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All these things likewise will occur. It's kind of interesting here, too, isn't it, that uh, he says, verse 13, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. What was Jesus promising to his disciples as they were going to be arrested? Yeah? And don't worry about what you're going to say. I will give you something at the time that your enemies will have a hard time refuting. <coughs> Just sort of interesting. <laughs> It talks about some of the uh, persecution that they're uh, facing over in some of these countries. Yeah, persecution doesn't uh, hasn't stopped. Uh, we 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 know that even in our own country there has been persecution of 
uh, of Christianity. Uh, the, the popular term for it is to cancel someone. Uh, people cancel uh, what goes online. Uh, Facebook will do that. Instagram will do that. Uh, lots of other places will go ahead and cancel you uh, and take away your ability to, to speak publicly about, about Jesus or about even moral issues. I'll tell you one of the quickest ways to get yourself canceled is to talk about homosexuality the way the Bible talks about it. That'll get you canceled real quick. Um, and now that I've said that, who knows what may happen? All of the physical things, but what's going to be in the end is the spiritual thing. It's going to counsel them as well. You know, yeah. total, that's when total destruction is going to occur. Yeah. Because the, the God knew this beforehand, that people were going to be rebellious, even during the Babylon captivity and all that stuff transpired and, and knew it was going to uh, you know, be a bloodbath. You know, it's going, to be, mm-hmm. it's going to be a travesty. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. Well, what do you suppose he means, though, when he says at first that some of them would be killed? Because that's what he says there, right? Um, verse 16. But you'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You'll be hated by all, uh, by, because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. How does that make any sense? Even though we're going, even though we are going to die, most likely, unless he comes again, we can speak, and, and the scriptures speak of us now as having eternal life. That's right. What he's really saying here is they may put you to death, but is that the end of your life? No. 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 Don't worry about the physical, yeah. because yeah. the physical is going to return back to the dust in which it came. Yeah. But the soul is going back to the, That's to right. the final judgment. That's what he's talking about. He says you may, to, to maybe paraphrase it a different way, you may, you may perish physically, but not a hair of your head spiritually will perish. It won't touch you. Um, which is a marvelous, uh, a marvelous promise. Well, we uh, we'll have to draw a line there, I guess, because our time has elapsed. And uh, so, uh, thanks for all the great comments and questions. And uh, if you're visiting us online, want to invite you to stay with us for another 15 minutes or so, because we're going to be having worship service in a bit. We'd certainly love to have you join us for that.